Well, Ramesh, thank you very much for taking time to meet with me today. We've known each other for a long time. And you've been in ministry now for well over 45 years, yes. actually. And in three very significant uh, international ministries. Uh, first in student ministry in Canada with IFES uh, in leadership role in the Middle East and then as honorary president of this global network of evangelical student ministries. Secondly, in the Lausanne movement from its inception in 1974 when you stayed up through the night with John Stott and a few others to work on uh, putting together the Lausanne Covenant, that is great historic document of the 20th century church. But perhaps the longest unbroken period of service you've enjoyed is as the General Secretary of the Egyptian Bible Society, which is the largest Bible society in the Middle East and has been astonishingly effective under your leadership for, I believe, 27 years now. But uh, in that period of many years of service with different agencies, you must have come across a lot of leaders who were overstretched, uh, maybe overburdened and burnt out. Um, why do you think that was the case? I, you know, I, um, in the 70s, when I was in um, student work in Quebec, I had a staff member who was younger than me, a little bit younger than me, and um, I was in charge of ministry. He just had one particular responsibility, but he was always exhausted. He was always nearly burning out, and I was worried pastorally. I didn't know what to do. So I met with his pastor, and his pastor told me his problem is that he is gift-oriented and that he is trying to exercise all his gifts at the same time, and so he's running right, left, and center and not focusing on the task at hand, the calling, that God had given him, which was high school ministry. So that little insight there made me think of how that should apply to my own life. And I've tried very carefully in my ministries then and after that to find out from God what his calling is and then to use the gifts God had given me that would help that calling, even if they weren't my primary gifts, and then to do a very, very hard task of putting aside other gifts that I, that I like, that I feel gifted in, things I'd want to do, so that I could focus on God's calling at that particular time or that period of time and, and accomplish what God had called me to do. Uh, could you offer any practical suggestions uh, for leaders who want to reorientate their focus from being gift-orientated as opposed to task-orientated? What what steps could, practically could people take uh, in order to make that shift from gift orientation to task orientation? Well, before the step, you have to have a conviction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and one of the convictions I've always had was that if God gives me life, I don't have to do everything at a given period of my life. And I have to look at my life in the long term rather than short term. I have a young person I'm mentoring who uh, is 40 years old and uh, wants to accomplish everything now <laughs> for fear that there won't be a future. And I keep saying, you know, there will be time. You have children now, you have responsibilities, but that person hasn't been able to understand that. And um, um, I think my advice is first to look in the long haul. I've just been at a seminar this morning here at this uh, forum of uh, uh, Christian leaders and uh, the, 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 the leader of the, of the seminar was analyzing the different stages of your life in decades, what your needs are in your first 10 years, your next 10 years, all the way up to your 90s. And it was very insightful for me to see that at each stage, each decade, he believed, was characterized by a certain um, accomplishment or approach or need. He used S's all to describe them. But it fit very much with what sort of I've thought of all my life is that I don't need to do everything now. Uh, if people don't believe that, then this advice won't help, Lindsay. Because if you tell someone, put aside some gifts for the sake of a calling, they will feel very sad about it. And they may do that thing, but be, be in a sense in mourning that they can't use a particular gift. But if they feel that their life is long range, then they will say, for this period, 
I will do that, and for the next period, I'll do that. I can give you an example. When I came back from Canada to Egypt to work with IFES, it was a very difficult transition. Um, I'd uh, left Egypt um, as a teenager from a very wealthy family. We lived uh, a very opulent lifestyle. Uh, Egypt in those days was a very comfortable place to live. Uh, and I came back 18 years later when Egypt was a socialist country. You didn't have many of the amenities of life. You had to line up uh, at the cooperative to buy uh, basic staples like oil and sugar. Uh, it felt very much like communist Russia, the images we have of, uh, of socialist states. And uh, for me to come back and not to be known and to be weak in Arabic, I felt I had nothing to offer. So in my work with IFES, then I focused on inductive Bible studies with small groups and worked basically for 10 years very much under the radar with few people, small work. But I knew that that was the right thing to do to build credibility in the country with Christian leaders and others to show them that I didn't want to come from overseas with a cookie-cutter approach, with a plan to impose on them, but I wanted to work under the church's leadership under other people's leadership. So I worked very quietly. It was a time when my children needed me, when my wife needed me, and it helped me focus on the family, give lots of time to my family. It also helped me invest in individuals' lives, some whom I felt had great potential, others I felt may not have mm -hmm. as great potential. Now, 20, uh, 37 years later, I see the fruit of these 10 years in remarkable ways. Mm -hmm. Every month or two, I meet someone in whom I invested during those 10 years who says that those, that investment bore fruit in his or her life many years later. And I realized that what to me was a sacrifice then of not being able to be the big Christian leader. I was deputy chairman of the Lausanne Committee at that time and unknown in Egypt. So that it was, a, 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 in a sense, a contradictory uh, life that I was living. But I realize now that this was God's call for me and that my faithfulness to accept his call and to put aside some of my other gifts was the right thing to do because now I'm reaping the fruit of those years. So the long-term perspective really pays off. And the concentration on the calling of God during a particular time meant that all these years in Egypt and most of my life, I have not been, been overstretched um, feeling burnt out, feeling discouraged. Uh, I live a fairly relaxed lifestyle. Now, you, my wife may say I'm overworked, mm -hmm. but I compare it with other Christian leaders in Egypt and other places, and I think compared to these people, I don't have these pressures. I don't have that tension uh, in my life. So do you have difficulty, do you find saying no easy? Because uh, uh, one of the problems for many leaders is the difficulty of um, saying no, the almost messianic-like uh, complex. What advice would you give to leaders or aspiring leaders who have difficulty in turning down uh, opportunities and invitations? In the West, it's respected to say no because of personal or family commitments. Mm -hmm. When I moved to Egypt, I realized if I said no because I had a date with my son or I had planned to take my wife out, it would not be accepted. So I quickly realized that in my date book, if I had an evening, because we had paper date books in those days, if I had an evening with my wife, I'd just say appointment or meeting. And when someone asked me, could you come and speak on Thursday night? I'd open my date thing and say, I'm very sorry, I have a previous commitment or meeting. If I had said it was with my wife, they wouldn't have accepted it. But they, didn't, they accepted the fact that I had a previous commitment. In cultures like the Middle East, it's very culturally inappropriate to say no. It's nearly as though you're denying Christ. And when I spoke to a Christian leader I respected in the early um, 80s and asked him how he decides on the many speaking commitments he has, he says, before God, I decide not to say no because I believe that everyone who asks me to do something is a direct call from God. Oh, wow. And I felt that was wrong. I really felt he was wrong. And I determined not to be that way. Now, it's lost me some friends. It's made some people not happy. But the only reason I could do it, Lindsay, was because I believed that I had priorities in my life and that pleasing people's needs or fulfilling their needs or just speaking to a group um, or just ex 
accepting that kind of invitation was not necessarily what God wanted me to do. And if God had called me to a task, I should think and pray over my schedule and be very careful. And my wife, Rebecca, uh, is also someone I had to be accountable to in those days because she would get very upset if I committed myself to too many things. So she helped me go through that process. But it's been an uphill battle. So I think the only way people can say no is if they're convinced in this principle that God has not called them to fulfill all their gifts at a given time, but has called them to accomplish a certain calling, a certain task, which is their primary um, ministry responsibility, and that they have a commitment to God to not let anything else get in the way of that primary ministry, being a pastor of a church, being a leader of a Christian organization, being a father and a husband and, and a, um, um, uh, a church member, so that you put these responsibilities, prioritize them, and then you put aside a host of things you could be doing. So when someone asks me, I can say no on principle now, rather than no because my date book's busy. So do you have principles or yes. guidelines yes. or some kind of framework that you've agreed uh, with Rebecca um, which help you to sift through invitations or opportunities and help you to discern what to focus on and what to reject? Yes, and the greatest struggle isn't with Rebecca, it's with the, the, the needs of a Bible society. We serve 800 churches. Uh, when I f we first began the ministry, I was the main speaker. So I would speak at, now we were not in 800 churches then, but I'd be the main Bible Sunday speaker. Um, and I realized if the organization was going to grow, as it now has grown, um, I would be a detriment to its growth because there's only so many Sundays I can be available for, or Fridays. So slowly, we began bringing other people in, church relations staff, we called them, and they began speaking instead of me, and I began insisting on not speaking. And that created a lot of difficulty. But the principle was that I want longevity for the Bible society and expansion. And if the pastors felt I spoke at one church and then refused to speak at theirs, they would get upset. So the last nearly 10 years, I've hardly spoken uh, at any of the 800 churches we speak at. And the ministry has flourished and people are happy. And it's going on okay. So one of the principles now is I don't speak at Bible Sundays. Mm. Uh, another principle is I don't anymore when I'm in the Bible society or very rarely accept speaking engagements that are not directly related to something to do with my work. Unless it's something that would benefit me personally in terms of building me up, equipping me, training me. So I say no to many invitations I get without praying about it. Because I have a list of, of priorities and I tell the person at this stage of my life, I will not do this certain activity, and so I cannot do what you're asking me for. Um, it's the same also when people uh, would write, and you've been involved in this, and offer me a job. I believe God has called me to the Bible Society, and so I don't even pray about a job offer, however interesting mm -hmm. or so-called appealing it may be, because I believe this is God. The day God calls me out of Bible Society, then I'll be open. But I don't consider job offers while I'm in a place where God has called me, and I'm convinced he wants me there. Now, I want to come back to the Bible Society afterwards, because I sure. think there are probably a number of lessons we can learn, and those who are watching this interview would be intrigued to know what God has been doing through it over the <laughs> years. But just to tease out a little bit uh, something that you said earlier, you seemed to imply that um, perhaps the earlier years of leadership are foundational years, where we're building in foundations for our lives, maybe a degree of credibility also, giving attention especially to the family. And it sounded as if you were implying that that later decades or later years uh, are amongst the most productive uh, potentially in our ministry. I suppose one could argue that there's productivity in each generation. But it's, it's not uncommon for some people today to say that the 50s and 60s are uh, amongst the most productive years uh, for a leader. Is that something you'd agree with? And if so, why? I think it's a cumulative effect. That is, it's, a, it's a, you're wiser, you're more able to manage yourself, you have more to offer as you grow older. It doesn't mean that very young people, I, one of the reasons I'm in ministry today is because the local church for which I became a believer asked me to preach when I was 17. 
And some of the elders at that particular church didn't attend that night because they disagreed with their fellow elders who had invited me to preach. Wow. Uh, it was a brethren church, and uh, they had a high standard of preaching. And some people said, we don't want to listen to a 17-year-old. But um, the risk they took to involve me, um, I was the youth representative on the Lausanne committee. And the first committee meeting was in 75 in um, Mexico City. And just a few years ago, when we were celebrating the 40th anniversary of Lausanne, they reprinted the minutes of that meeting. And I was startled, shocked. I couldn't believe it. When I read that in the closing day, the Wednesday evening, I gave a devotional at the Lausanne continuation meeting, which had 50 of the world's great leaders there, including Billy Graham and uh, Stan Mooneyham and Bill uh, Vonat Bright and all these people. I can't imagine how I accepted. I must have, been, had, must have uh, had rocks in my head, and I don't know what, I, what on earth I could have said. But people risked with me at a young age. But it didn't mean that I had the maturity to lead big organizations in those days. But I, so I'm saying we don't want to snuff the, out the voice of young people. Mm-hmm. We, young people can, uh, can speak prophetically to us. They can, they can contribute uh, an incredible amount. So what I, I'm not saying that people can't make remarkable uh, contributions to ministry when they're young. But I am saying that the cumulative experience over many years in many contexts gives you a depth and a, a create, and a, uh, how do you say, a reservoir of, of, that you can draw from that then allows you to be more productive, not necessarily to be more effective, not necessarily to, you may not have the energy to do what you did to build up a ministry, but you may have the energy to move it forward uh, when others are doing the hard work. Uh, my work at the Bible side today is more in the area of inspiration, of challenging, and of pastoring people who are much more gifted than I am. I'm the glue that keeps them together, the oil between that keeps the gears working with these very high-powered uh, uh, leaders. Um, but I don't do the hard um, uh, work that I used to do when I was 30 or 40. So would you argue that the role of a leader of a ministry in their, say, late 50s, 60s, 70s should be different Definitely. to the way in which they function as a leader, perhaps earlier on? And how, how is that exemplified in your own ministry? Well, in my own ministry, I mean, the Bible site, I didn't begin it, but we started with 13 staff. Um, I did everything in those days, you know. I, I knew everything about every... I mean, I went through the budget, did the actual details, uh, did the fundraising. Did, I mean, I knew everything and did a lot of the work. And over the years, um, we have different departments. We have a sales and church relations department. We have a, a finance and administration department. We have a, a publishing department. Over the years, um, I headed up each of these departments, so I knew the work. But now there are people more competent than me heading it up. It's a much bigger operation. There's no way, uh, if I had kept my hands in the work uh, as it grew, I would have been a hindrance to the work. But I had to let go. But let me tell you, Lindsay, what I've seen with many Christian leaders. Delegation is an art. And there's a sl- very fine line between delegation and abdication. So to delegate responsibility, to empower others, to never pull the rug from under their feet, to allow them to make mistakes, I- is a gift. And that one has to develop if one is to, be a- to let the organization grow and to make the people who are leading it feel empowered and given ownership. They have to believe the buck stops with them. They have to believe that they have to do work. They have to believe you will not come in and cancel or override what they've done. You may disagree with it. You tell them about it, but you wait till the next time. And then they can maybe correct it if they agree with you. But you never. So that empowers people. The danger, however, there's a very fine line between that and abdicating. And particularly, I'm talking here to maybe people who are in leadership, particularly to the finances of the organization. I have seen many, too many Christian leaders give up the financial, um, I'm not talking the accounting, I'm talking about the financial decision making of the organization to a finance director or to a a business person. And eventually the organization will change in character because it's it's going to be managed and led 
by a finance director who doesn't have a spiritual vision, rather than by a visionary leader who uses finances to accomplish his vision. So the worst thing that happened to many organizations I've seen is that the business person said, no, you can't do this. No staff have to raise so much of their support or have to do this. It becomes a business decision, not a leadership decision. I'm not against all these decisions. We have to make hard financial decisions. But they have to be done as a team after lots of prayer, and they should not be uh, simply by a finance person who looks at the figures and tells the leader, this is what you have to do. There's no other way to do it. If the leader abdicates this to the finance, in the long run, the organization will lose its spiritual impact, its vision, mm -hmm. its sense of movement, and will be simply a business. So, yes, de delegate. Yes, refuse. I'll give you an example. Someone phoned me the other day. I get, rarely get phone calls about work. And he said, a person I know, and he said, I want to buy this book, Bible. I said, fine, let's go to Bible study and buy. He said, oh, but I phoned one of your staff. They gave me a 20% discount. And I told him I know the boss. He gave me 50%. I said, actually, I don't know the price of a book. I have no authority to give discounts. And you, you should go with that person who gave you 20% because that's fine. But I can't give you any more, and it's been 15 years since I have any authority to give discounts for Bibles. And it's true. I haven't been involved. Otherwise, I have a line of people standing at my door mm -hmm. wanting exceptional discounts, and I cause a lot of trouble. But it's that uh, giving up of certain things and being rigorous about not taking it back and not breaking your, your commitment to your staff. I will not interfere. I will let you do it. But on the other hand, knowing very well what they're doing and making sure that it's being done with the spiritual goals. And that's why the people you bring in, and I've made mistakes bringing some people, I had to leave them, are not people who only accomplish tasks, but who have the same spiritual vision, uh, whether they're finance people or whether they're um, sales people or whatever they are. They have to have a spiritual vision of leading that team. It's very difficult. It's taken us years sometimes to find the right person because you could find a person. Once we were looking for a business manager and my two fellows, what you call vice presidents, so this would be the third man, told me, Ramis, your standards are too high. Let's just get a person. It doesn't have to be a believer. This, after all, is, is finance. And I stuck my foot down against their will. And there was a lot of uh, negative. They, they, they were mad at me at the time and upset. And... Um, I stuck to it. I said, I'm only going to bring a finance person if he has a spiritual vision. Otherwise, we go like we are going. Because I'd seen the destruction these people have done. And now they thank me for that decision and realize they were wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, at that time, they were angry at me. They felt I didn't want to give up this part of it or I was holding on too much. Very dangerous, Lindsay. So delegate and don't, um, in a sense, pull the rug from other people, but don't abdicate. Very helpful principles. You're raising various strands of thought. I want to pursue, if you okay. don't mind, uh, come back to. Um, one is, uh, you've obviously provided quite directive and strong leadership. Have you found any system of accountability which has personally helped you to keep on track? Or do you have any system of accountability, apart from discussing things with uh, your wife and a board? Um, do you have any other more informal network of friends uh, uh, to whom you're accountable? I know that John Stott, one of your mentors, used to have a group he called AGE, Accountability Group. I'm not sure what the E stand stood for, but they worked through his diary, for example, with him and looked at other invitations. Do you have anything like that? Or what, what, what advice would you give to a leader about developing an accountability group? It's changed over years. But where I'm at now is it's my senior leadership team, and we meet usually once a week, at most once every two weeks, and we discuss many things, but we also discuss each other's commitments in terms of speaking engagements, things we're going to do, and so on. And I will not make any major decisions without going back to them. And I will take their advice, and I will consult them especially on many things I write, whether it's a newsletter, or a, um, or a discussion I have with someone uh, in terms of debating things. Um, and there's a lot of delicate things in contracts and dealings and all this kind of thing. And I very much appreciate the wisdom of these men. 
I have an assistant, a PA, and she's a woman, and she also has a sense. Uh, she's been with the organization longer than me, so I consult with her as well as with my wife. So uh, consult with a lot of people, uh, officially with these leaders, but if there's something that relates to someone else, uh, I really would listen to a junior staff member even and ask their advice about the situation. I'm very careful to sleep on any important decision, especially on drafts of letters. I will draft a letter, sleep on it, have people give me feedback, and then look at it the next day. I've made a lot of mistakes when in my frustration and anger, I've sent off an angry letter to someone. And it's created a lot of problems for me and for others. And it, may made, me have, it made me feel good the day I wrote it, but badly when I had to reap the consequences. Mm -hmm. So if you're upset, if you're in a crisis, get counseling, but sleep on something, look at it, Take a few, few days, even a few weeks before you answer. The, day, the danger we have, and someone told me this at the second Lausanne Congress when the facts had been discovered. As we are preparing for the second Lausanne Congress in 89, the leader of the Congress, the man who was in charge there, Paul McCoy, he was the administrator, he said, Ramez, we have a real crisis. I said, what is it, Paul? He said, snail mail meant we had two weeks to decide uh, before we made decision. The people didn't expect an answer for two weeks. We could take a week and then send it. Now, they send the facts in the morning and an answer in the afternoon. And he said, that has changed the nature of decision makers. And wise people often cannot make very quick decisions. So we're changing the face of leadership. He predicted a change in leadership because of the uh, coming in of a fax machine. And with emails and WhatsApps and all these things and the quick back and forth, I think, Lindsay, we have lost the statesmanship kind of leadership we used to have, where a Jack Dane would dictate a three-page letter, or a Leighton Ford would dictate a letter, or Billy Graham, whenever I wrote to him, I, I wrote very rarely to him, but when I was on the design committee, he would answer a letter well thought out and written, sometimes a page or two uh, of issues. When I was a president of a student association at Gordon Conwell, I wrote to him once, I was very upset by something, and he was the honorary uh, uh, chairman of the board of, of Gordon Conwell. And he wrote back and answered. But I'm sure his letter, he prayed about it, took time, and wrote, wrote, wrote it. So that kind of statesmanship has been lost in our fast communication, in the, the, the urgency to answer today. Well, Samuel Escobar once said the only thing 20th century man discovered was speed. Yes. Um, how do you advise the next generation of leaders to uh, wisely use mod modern technology for communication and providing leadership then, apart from sleeping on uh, responses before sending them. Uh, our capacity to make many more mistakes through uh, excessively quick judgments yes. is increased. Do you, give any uh, do you have any advice for younger leaders? It's, it's related to several things. It's partly the sense of our own importance. This person needs a reply quickly. Why? because we feel we're very important. If we don't give him the reply, he's going to be in bad shape. Very few urgent things are important. And it's very important to know the difference between the urgent and the important. And often we get the trouble with the urgent, or we're urgent with the important when important things are not usually urgent. And urgent things are not usually important. So there's a lot of confusion there. But it's partly a pride thing where you feel, or it's an anger thing or thing, a response, you feel, well, my goodness, I'm going to tell him. Mm -hmm. um, so the instinct to respond quickly is, a, is, a, is an urge we all have. So my first advice, which I've just said, is don't answer quickly. Uh, but you can acknowledge quickly, but not answer quickly. Mm -hmm. And people today get very nervous if they send you an email. I, uh, somebody sent me something very important a few days ago. Um, I, and two days later, his secretary wrote and said, why hasn't he responded? Well, it was an issue. I had no way I could have responded on, but I realized my mistake was I should immediately said, thank you for your email. I will study it with my staff and get back to you. So I tried to do that. Also, in the mass of emails we get, as the Christian leader gets dozens or hundreds, it's helpful to have someone else to help you organize them. Mm -hmm. So I try to have all my emails um, uh, that are not very personal go to my PA as well. And she organizes them and reminds me. Because it's very easy when you get 20 emails in a day 
to forget. And then people get upset. And she will then say, Ram has got your letter, he will be answering you. So that provides the person the assurance that the letter is being considered and the patience to wait for the answer. So mechanisms do not make you answer quickly. Mechanisms to know who should answer. The temptation is, the letter is addressed to you. You assume it's for you to answer. Maybe about 60% of the letters I receive, I have other people answer in the Bible Society who are more competent or even outside the Bible Society. I'll tell the person, I forwarded your letter to such and such a person, to someone at the seminary, to someone, because they have more uh, appropriateness. So to ref not to feel you have to answer everything, but again to acknowledge uh, thing. And finally, uh, I think um, sometimes, sometimes, um, maybe it's not sometimes, a lot, you'd say no. I will not deal with this matter, or I cannot answer. To admit that this is an issue that you cannot handle. And you don't know who to send it to. And uh, someone here met me and he said, you didn't answer my email and I, um, I'm trying to think. And I think, and it was a mistake on my part, I decided I wouldn't answer it. I should have said thank you for your email. I didn't have the guts to say that. I didn't want to answer that particular email. Because sometimes answering will cause more trouble than not answering. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier on you hinted at disappointments, even failures or discouragements, particularly with some appointments you made didn't seem to work out. Someone once said to me that if you want to be a leader, uh, I heard this many years ago, you've got to develop a bottomless capacity to handle disappointment. And one of the things that stresses out leaders, I suppose, is when things go wrong and they don't turn out as they hoped they would. Um, do you have any advice about how, how to handle disappointment? Um, perhaps, and also, in your experience, how, have you, how has God helped you to turn setbacks into springboards? Do you have any examples, for example, of that happening in the Bible Society? Well, let's start backwards quickly. Uh, the first thing is, they say the best time to fire a person is when you appoint them. <laughs> <laughs> so be very, very careful of appointments. Take your time, particularly senior appointments. Mm -hmm. And don't cut corners. And I'm very much convinced that character is more important than competence. Mm. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, choose people who are able and, how's it go? Um, uh, in Second Timothy 2.2, 2, um, in Arabic you say, basically, capable and competent. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, competent and um, able and, anyway, it's, it's the two areas mm -hmm. of the thing. So competence is very good. You need a qualified person to handle your finances. But his character is more important than his competence because you can increase a person's competence. You rarely can change character. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a Bible study with teenagers once, a 17 year old boy said, Paul said that to Timothy because he failed to do it. And I said, Where do you get that from? In chapter 1, verse 15, he said, All that are in Asia abandon me. Mm -hmm. So obviously, Paul had chosen the wrong people if they abandoned him. He told Timothy, Don't do that. So be very careful. So I've had to fire people, and I think in both, in, in, in cases of senior leaders I've had to let go, it's always been that their competence was much greater than their character, and they accomplished a lot, and I kept them on because they were accomplishing, but they were character disaster, and were destroying the ethos of the organization as they were making great accomplishments for Bible study. And it's very hard to let them go, but I realized it, it, and because I knew I couldn't find someone as competent as them. But I said, you know, if you go away of competence in Christian work and don't have character, uh, you destroy the organization. How have you learned from failure personally, or how have you turned setbacks into springboards? Well, at the Bible Society, we meet a lot of what we call closed doors. And um, the typical Egyptian way to handle a situation where you're told no is to find another way to do it. If you go to a government office and the official says, this paper won't, won't, won't work, you go to another office that does the same function, and the guy who says, fine, it works. It's often based on the person. So I've said, when doors are closed, let's look for a window. And so often when we've had a door closed in front of us as, as a staff, we prayed and thought about it, said, well, how can we get around this legally? Well, but find another way of doing it. And not be so stubborn that we have to do it in the way we conceive of, 
but find a way that's maybe not as efficient, maybe not as good, but will eventually accomplish the task we want. So go behind the issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very Middle Eastern, and uh, it's, uh, it's helped us do a lot of things. So for instance, we're not allowed to give out free scripture in Egypt um, from the government's point of view. So we've said there's nothing wrong with selling it. We won't give anything away to non-Christians, people on the street. We'll just sell it, but we sell it cheaply. People come to Egypt, stand on street corners, young people coming on a mission trip and start giving out scripture. They get arrested, sent back to their country, and they cry, persecution, Christians are persecuted, we can't do everything. Same time, at a book fair, we can give out, or uh, sell 7,000 New Testaments for 10 U.S. cents, and uh, everyone's happy because we're selling them, technically. Someone's coming into our shop, paying the money and taking it. It's not construed of as proselytism. So why not accept it? Why be stubborn? Why say, I must give it out free as the only way to evangelize, for instance? Many other such examples. Mm -hmm. So um, work with a system. Uh, work around uh, regulations that are difficult. Find a way to work to respect the regulation, but to still accomplish what you want to do. Our problem in Egypt is not that we have any obstacles from the government. It's that the open doors we have, or open windows, are much greater than our human or financial resources. Mm -hmm. we, can do, we can do much more um, than we are allowed to do. I want to come back and ask you a couple of questions about the Egyptian Bible Society in a moment. But just one last question about your own style of working. There's a, a friend we have who's a Spanish psychiatrist, Pablo Martinez, who talks about the empty swimming pool syndrome that lots of leaders uh, are exposed to. By that he means that in a swimming pool to keep the water clean, uh, water, dirty water has to go out and fresh water come in. And he argues that many Christian leaders are guilty of the empty swimming pool syndrome. They're giving out a lot and nothing fresh is coming in. So they get dry, frustrated, uh, discouraged. On that basis, how important do you think rest and recreation is for a leader? And what have you personally found helpful as a means of uh, experiencing uh, physical and other renewal? Uh, in order that you can continue in the work for so many years? It's changed over the years. When we had young children, we had a sacred family day. It was Saturday. And uh, we turn off our phones. And in those days, you didn't have cell phones, but you'd have a phone attached to the wall. So I got a little switch to put on the phone. And literally, our phone wouldn't ring all day. And uh, we told the children, this is your day. And we'd go out to them. We'd do things. Until today, our children remember it. Uh, and it impacted their lives. So during that, we've tried to do that with our grandchildren more recently, haven't been as successful. They, they and us have so many different activities. There's so much more to do these days than 30 years ago. But we still attempt to do that. So that's one way we did it as a family, and I think was brilliant to just concentrate that day on us and our kids religiously. So I'd refuse to speak on those days. I'd give up a lot of things. There might be certain situations where there'd be exceptions, but very rare exceptions. Um, the other thing my wife and I did always is at least twice a year, we'd go away without the children. And that was difficult. We had no uh, in-laws to leave them with grandparents. Uh, so we'd have to find someone to stay with them. But instead of being upset, our children were proud of the fact that we loved each other so much that we would leave them and go away for a weekend. Mm -hmm. And that meant something to them. It, it made them feel more secure in our love for one another. Mm -hmm. Now, Rebecca and I have a little apartment by the Red Sea, and we work very hard to get away once every three weeks for longish weekends. And it hasn't been easy, but we work on it. And it, it's, it's, a restore, it's a restorative kind of thing. Sure. And we take sometimes friends with us, um, and sometimes grandchildren. And definitely, <laughs> as much as we can, take grandchildren. Mind you, the advantage of grandchildren is they have school on Sunday, and we don't at the Bible site. So they leave Saturday, and we recuperate from them on Sunday. Yeah. So we go back relaxed, yeah. because having yeah. grandchildren at a Exhausting, resort yeah. is, takes a lot of energy. Yeah. But, so it changes with the time, but the idea of disciplined time alone, time with your family, time with your wife, time with your kids, time with your grandkids, um, is, is something we've tried. Mm. We failed as much as we succeeded, but our successes have been enough, I think, to carry us on. 
and to to be an encouragement. Thank you. Well, before we close, I, I, I do want to ask you a couple of questions about the Bible Society, because I know you've invested 27 years in that ministry. It's a very significant work across the Middle East. As you look back now with the benefit of hindsight, over nearly three decades in the Bible Society in Egypt, what encourages you or excites you most about the various aspects of the Bible Society's ministry in which you've been engaged in Egypt over these close to three decades? There isn't much time to, to do it. I think the first thing that would encourage me is we have some of the best staff we've ever had. We have harmony in the staff team. We have generally a happy staff. We have 220 staff, so you'd expect tensions and difficulties and so on. And as far as I know, we're in the best stage we've ever been in. And that's a build-up. When people stay with you for a long time and you build an ethos, you tend to, um, to get to a place where you've worked through some of the hassles. So uh, from the mood, ethos, from the physical plan, from everything, things are going well. But what's exciting me personally the most is the biggest challenge for Bible agencies is Bible engagement. We don't want to give out scriptures. We want scripture to people to engage. We've been successful over the last... 15 years to get children to engage with scripture. We have endless programs of engaging children, Sunday school children, uh, junior high school children with the scriptures, competitions, uh, coloring books for little kids, uh, CDs, events. Last year we did uh, 500 events for children across the country and we work with a larger Coptic church and so on. So we've succeeded, but we have not been very successful with youth. We've had two breakthroughs with youth that to me, uh, uh, are very excited. One I had nothing to do with. Uh, our staff decided last year to have a, a You've Got Talent competition uh, to get young people to come. And they got uh, it all done in the Coptic church. They, uh, Coptic churches have big festivals in memory of saints. So they had this big event, uh, uh, built a tent on a thousand square meters and had several thousand people be in the tent all day on different events. But in the evening they have this talent show. And each priest would come with five of the top students and his young people in his church with talents related to a biblical theme. So they could sing, they could act, they could draw, they could uh, do anything they, they want to do. And what we realized is not only did these young people have remarkable gifts, that they were these are village, so the deprived area young people, but they were ministering to the young people in the audience. So we didn't, hadn't taken into account that aspect of it because this was ministry so they were saying things spiritually and the people sitting there were being impacted by their fellow young people ministering to them and they were redoing it uh, this week actually I'm very upset that I'm not there in Egypt uh, this is taking place um, tomorrow uh, and the day after uh, and our staff will go and watch it but a very brilliant way of engaging with the scriptures so they're on a biblical theme using talent and this, I could walk, talk for hours about that the other thing is, we've partnered with an organization which God had used me to start uh, in the early 80s called the St. Timothy Center for Inductive Bible Study, which was part of the IFES work in the 80s. And I didn't, wasn't involved in that partnership, but uh, we've, we've done a big partnership with it as a Bible society to help encourage inductive Bible study in churches. We've had two big events, and the last one there were 100 lay people and 41 priests and the teaching was done by the lay people. And nearly all the priests gave wonderful testimonies how they learned to see the scriptures in a new way. And uh, this was in the Alexandria area. And they've already started many small Bible study groups in Alexandria. Now that's the fruit of something I did quietly in the 80s. That's only beginning to blossom in a big way uh, now. And uh, that's why I'm saying the long-term look, Lindsay. Some of the people... Uh, none of the people who are doing it are people I invested in. They're disciples, maybe the second or third generation of people I invested in in the 80s. But the vision of studying the Bible inductively to observe, understand, and apply the text never perished, and it grew. And somehow, the Bible Society now, partnering with the St. Timothy Center, 
I believe this can go all over country and can do a great impact in the country. Well, one of the great advantages of living into our 60s and 70s exactly. is that we can see the how God has labor. worked over 40, 50 years. Exactly. One last question I wanted to ask you about. I think from an outsider's perspective, it seems to me the Bible Society and your leadership in Egypt has had a huge impact across the nation and across the region. But two or three years ago, there was a tragic event uh, in Libya where a group of young men from Coptic back, Christian backgrounds were kidnapped and were beheaded by an ISIS-backed group. That must have come as an enormous shock when you first heard of what had happened, and it was screened on YouTube and so on. How did you respond to that in the Bible Society? It was a Sunday night. I was actually having a Bible study in my home, and one of the young men opened his, um, was looking at his cell phone and saw it. So we, on, we opened television and uh, saw some of these awful scenes. It was a great shock. Um, we didn't know what to do. And um, I phoned my publishing staff and said, we have to respond somehow. The president came on national television and declared uh, seven days of mourning all across Egypt for that thing. First time in 40 years, we deployed the Egyptian Air Force and went and bombed the place where ISIS was supposed to have done it without anybody's permission. That was Libya. So that, uh, and, and the president came out, went the next day and gave his condolences to the patriarch. So the government the, the, of Egypt and Egypt as a nation felt this was an offense to, uh, on its people. The president called them my young men. Mm. He didn't call them Christians. He said, my young men, our young men. Um, that response said, we have to do something. The next morning, I went to my office and one of the Coptic Orthodox young women who works for us, her name is Dahlia, was beaming. All of us were very depressed. I mean, it was a very depressing situation. I said, Dahlia, why on earth are you happy? She said, because I'm Coptic Orthodox. I've been raised all my life saying we're the church of the martyrs. And it didn't relate to me. I didn't believe there were any martyrs in the 21st century. This was something of the first few centuries. When I saw that video of these simple, uneducated boys working in Libya just to eke out a living, being given the option to deny their faith and saying no, we're willing to die and be beheaded instead of denying Jesus. I said, this is true witness. These are people who believe Jesus is the most valuable thing. She said, it reinvigorated my faith. It made me believe that we are the church of the martyrs, that martyrdom is witness, and it can be effective today. And she was just uh, a different person. And I realized that this was the first ever in church history where we had a video of martyrdom. And that video went viral on TV, and people realized there are people today who are willing to die for their faith. And then the remarkable response of their families. When the prime minister went to the home of a mother and her sisters, where seven boys from one extended family had been killed, and sitting on the floor in that poor home in that village, the woman said, the prime minister asked her, you know, what do you feel about these people who did it? She said, I'm angry that they did it, I'm upset at them, but... Uh, I'm praying for their repentance and I'm not uh, sorry for my sons because I believe they have gone to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I have a privilege of them being martyrs. I'm proud of them. One of them ever said, if my son had denied Jesus, I'd kill him myself. And for the Muslim leaders of Egypt to see the faith of these simple village women, there wasn't anger, there wasn't a sense of revenge. There was sadness, great sadness. But they were saying, this is wrong, this shouldn't have happened. But God was there. We printed a little tract and uh, distributed 1.6 million copies across Egypt. By Wednesday, they were printed. This was Monday. We designed it on Monday, printed on Tuesday, distributed on Wednesday. And it went like wildfire. And Muslims were getting it and giving it to Christians even. Um, and in it, the whole question was, who are the real victors? What's really happening? And we contrasted the men in black who were walking with the Egyptian, the Egyptian captives who were dressed in, in orange, like Guantanamo Bay, a, a, a jibe of the Americans. And we're saying, who are the powerful ones? Who is really, these guys with their faces covered, contrasted with the other men with their eyes looking up to heaven, like Stephen, uh, awaiting death, but looking forward. They were praying to Jesus. It was obvious on the tape that they were calling out to Jesus. So the tract contrasted these two using scriptures that would bring it. And it, it was a very powerful tract. And a man wrote a poem contrasting these two was one of the most powerful tracks we've ever done. And uh, we've did things for earthquakes. We did recently a special distribution when Pope Francis came to Egypt. But we found that scriptures being distributed during an occasion, 
whether it's a sad one or a happy one, are a wonderful way of getting God's word out in our country. But it has to be done quickly, it has to be creative, it has to be attractive. Well, I've read that tract, and it's an enormously powerful tract. I hope that many people watching this interview will get access to it. As if they look at Bibles for Egypt, the word Bibles, and then the number four, and then Egypt.com, uh, uh, they'll find it there. Biblesforegypt.com. Well, may God give grace to those of us watching this and to the wider global church to answer the question, what can we lead, learn from God's people in the church in Egypt? Ramez Zatala, General Secretary of the Bible Society of Egypt, thank you for sharing with us Thank today. you, Lindsay.